Bingo, we're back. Think Tech, Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel, and we have Jesse Broder Van Dyke. He's the Communications Director of the City and County of Honolulu. Wow. Thanks for coming down, Jesse. Thanks so much for having me, Jay. It's a pleasure. Very exciting. Can you tell us about your life and career that led you to this fabulous job with the city? And by the way, Jesse's office, can you point it out? Where is oh, your it's office? It's right here. This right one right there. here. There it is. There's Jesse's <laughs> office, okay? <laughs> right there in Honolulu, Holly. So tell us how you got to be where you are. Well, actually, my first job in communications was right here in this building. Uh, I worked as, at KCCN uh, doing traffic segments uh, from their helicopter reporter back then uh, and producing them every 10 minutes for air. Um, then after college, I got a job at KHON uh, and worked my way up to producer there. I uh, got to produce the 530 World News with Joe Moore. And uh, while I was producing that, I was concentrating on Congress and the presidency and following our local delegation. And uh, I applied for a long shot job in Senator Kaka's office and ended up getting it and had a great experience working up there for six years. It was an uh, amazing time in Hawaii's history to have Senator Inouye and Senator Akaka with so much seniority up there and getting to witness the first Hawaii-born president be elected. Yeah. And when Senator retired, um, I got the opportunity to come back home and work for Mayor Caldwell and work for my hometown every day, which was a really, really rewarding experience. Okay, there's a few lessons in there. One is go to school in film and communications. Yes. Two is if you don't get the job you want, reapply. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and third is, you know, produce TV. You can come down here and help us anytime, right. Jesse. All right. <laughs> and then, you know, you can have Jesse's job. <laughs> I like your job. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, you just came off an election. Yes. That must have been very exciting and maybe a little bit stressful. Uh, tell us about how it is to be the communications director of the city and county of Honolulu in the middle of a hard-fought uh, mayor mayoral race. Yeah, it was a major learning experience for me. I've never actually had to work on a campaign before because the whole six years I worked for Senator Kaka, he was on his last term. Um, we didn't even know if we were going to have an opponent until the very last day that people could file. Um, and um, former Congressman DeJue uh, filed on the last day and held a press conference right outside of my office, right, right here. <laughs> and uh, um, they went to work and uh, it ended up being a pretty negative campaign. They, probably spent a million dollars attacking my boss. Um, and uh, we still had to run the city every day, so uh, we already have a full day of work. Um, there is a separate campaign staff that is responsible for responding to specific things from the campaign, but uh, if they end up attacking a city issue, for example, they did a press conference about moving the Hawaii Kai Satellite City Hall, um, which there was actually a perfectly good explanation for. the. Uh, landlord wanted to double the rent and we didn't think that was a good value for taxpayers but I didn't know that then when they had the press conference so I had to drop what I was doing and spend a couple hours hunting that down but we were able to respond and the story ended up coming out just it fine. Has to be able to respond to anything. Right. That's why I enjoy having you on the show. I can ask you any question. Yeah, You're I get, unfettered. I get to be an idiot savant and know a little <laughs> bit about everything and the like, best part of my job is I can call any of the directors at any time on their cell phone and yeah. get straight to the experts. So oh, that's learn so an incredible cool. Amount. <laughs> Another great side of that job. Yeah. So here we are looking forward. Okay, digging in, you know, with the new administration, trying to get our hands around, you know, lots of issues that that need to be resolved. Um, and I just I want to know what's on your plate as you see it. What are the critical issues that have to be dealt with and and uh, you know discussed with the public? Mm -hmm. Well, I think everybody knows that homelessness is a major issue on Oahu. Um, it continues to be. I think we've made some real progress. Um, we've created a lot of housing. We housed over 800 veterans. Um, we're doing innovative things like Housing First, the Holly Maliola Navigation Center. Slow down and tell me what these are about. Okay, uh, the Holly Maliola Navigation Center is the innovative containers units that we put out in Sand Island. Um, uh, IHS is running it. Um, it's a IHS is a great organization. Really great. Uh, Connie Mitchell and IHS have really stepped up and made a major, major impact. Um, and Mayor Caldwell is hugely thankful for the work that they do. I think we all should be. Yep. Um, so they've got uh, about 80 people living down there. Um, everybody's there for less than three months and they get transitioned out to some other form of housing. We found that there's some homeless individuals who are not open to going into shelters or other short-term things. So the Holly Maliola is sort of outdoors, but you get your own private container unit. Um, so it's sort of a first step to moving into housing. Mm -hmm. And IHS like, has time to evaluate people and figure out what the best type of housing is. Some people are eligible for veterans, vouchers. 
Some people are ready for housing first, which, in which you put people into units and then give them services instead of the old model where you require them to be clean and sober and ready to go before you'll give them housing. Um, so that's been very effective, and it's, uh, we've had uh, like the U.S. HUD staff come out here and take a look at it oh, as good. a possible best practices. Yeah, well, we talk about your relationship with the federal government mm -hmm. in the later part of the show, but um, is this, this is not by any means the solution to the problem. There must be more coming down the pike. How, how do you see it unfolding in the course of this next term? Uh, what, what do we need to do? What can we do? Where the problem is going to be? Well, at the city level, we're chipping away at it by creating more housing. A big underlying part of the problem is that people need services. A lot of homeless individuals have mental illness or drug abuse problems, and they need professional help. So we're working with the state on uh, making more of those types of services available and trying to take every facet, uh, all these innovative different ways, Housing First, the Navigation Center, uh, continuing to fund shelters and um, trying to work with our nonprofit partners to create solutions. Would you agree with me that a lot of the steps that have been taken, not only by the city, but by so many charitable organizations, nonprofits of every kind in nature, and mm. in fact, government agencies, state and federal as well, um, that largely cosmetic in the sense that we have, you know, structural, economic, social problems in mm -hmm. this community mm -hmm. that, you know, are always going to be pushing people toward homelessness. That is, wages not high enough, and cost of occupancy is too high, mm -hmm. and the two, they don't meet unless you change one or the other of those, of those elements, no? There's absolutely a number of people living at the IHS family shelter who are working every day but still can't afford to pay rent or move their family into housing. So that's absolutely true. I think, you know, there's always this rumor that uh, people get one-way tickets from the mainland out here. I don't think that there's government institutions doing that, but I do think a lot of people believe that Hawaii is a great place to move to. They've heard about this place. They want to come here. It is, in my opinion, the best place in the world. But, of course, it has one of the highest costs of living. So people come here. They end up being homeless. They don't have any family here to help them. And they can't afford a plane ticket home. So we've partnered with the uh, um, Hawaii Tourism and Lodging Association, and they're making... Uh, offering to buy tickets for people who have family members who are willing to meet them back home and, and take them into home, housing back where they're from. Yeah, and it's in their interest to try to minimize the homeless problem because it's not good for tourism for tourists to see homeless everywhere. Definitely. But are we making progress, do you think? I mean, and if we're not, how do we make progress? I mean, I, I, nobody would say let's stamp out homelessness because right. it doesn't work that way. Um, but maybe somebody would say let's manage it so that it, it doesn't become a blight uh, for the for the ordinary people, ordinary middle class working and homed yep. homed people, absolutely. Um, you know, you take for example Pua'a Park um, on King Street that uh, had homeless individuals living in it for quite a long time. There was no bathroom there, so they're using the bathroom at the piano store ne next door, and. Uh, through consistent enforcement going every day, every day, we were able to um, make clear the park. And there's a senior housing uh, building right next door. And now when we go by, we see seniors enjoying the park. And they tell us, you know, for years they weren't comfortable with going there. So, you know, we, we certainly don't want to be cruel. Um, part of the enforcement is creating housing and giving people options. But we also don't want to tolerate individuals or groups of people taking over public space and monopolizing it only for themselves and making it so that seniors, kids, families can't use our parks. So I do think we've been very successful at cleaning up parks. Um, HBD uh, aggressively enforces park closure hours all over the island now. Um, during the day, our stored property ordinance enforcement crew goes by and does regular enforcement. So I think if you look at places like Alamana Beach Park, Waikiki, Pua'a Park, Thomas Square, things are better, definitely not solved. Um, and like you said, all we're ever going to do is make progress. I think we've made progress, and we're going to have to keep, keep making progress. Um, but, you know, every year, new people become homeless, and new people move here. And so all we can do is work with our nonprofit partners and try to help as many as we can. What about <clears throat> raising the minimum wage? What about rent control on rents in the ordinary market? Um, raising the minimum wage would certainly help. Um, I, I, like I said, there's people who have jobs, two jobs even, who can't make ends meet. True. Um, there's also other individuals who aren't trying to work and need like mental health care. Um, so we are, we're trying to create more affordable housing. Um, we're doing TOD incentives, transit-oriented development incentives along the rail line. 
we're working with developers and trying to require more affordable housing. It's always a balance because they'll say, if we make too much of a requirement, then they're going to stop building more housing. So we want housing for everyone, right? Both high end, low end, middle income um, housing available for everyone. Um, there's a definite need for more units on this island. We know that every year that goes by, more and more people are going to move here. It's, it's nothing we can do to stop that. All we can do is plan for it. Um, some more housing, especially in the urban corridor along the rail line where people can ride to work and school, um, and less development out in the country because that just leads to more traffic. Um, so I, I do think the rail line is going to help a lot with um, housing. Unfortunately, it's still years away. We should have done it 20 years ago, but yeah, yeah. Um, we are moving forward and uh, very optimistic and enthusiastic about getting to ride it in a few years. Okay. Well, he said the magic word. He said rail. Okay, no discussion of the city and the communications director of the city like Jesse Broder Van Dyke is complete without asking him about rail. I'm going to take a short break to let him prepare his answer, <laughs> and then we'll be back and we'll ask him. You'll see. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I host the show Center Stage on Think Tech Wednesdays at 2 p.m., and this is Crystal That's Quark. That's right. I'm Crystal, and I host so Quark Talk on Tuesday yeah. mornings. I like watching Donna's show. <laughs> you do. I like watching your show. I like watching your show because you talk about you're not afraid to really dive into issues that are important and and sometimes they're a little shocking and you always bring us information that is sometimes the underbelly that we Ooh, need to know and we need to you. see. It's important. Well said. Well, I like yours because you can find any topic and any type of character, but you will find that source which brought them to the product of that creative process. And I thought that's like the most important thing is the process. Awesome. Right? I think, yeah, I do. I think it's all about the process. And I think we'll find world peace when we know each other's stories. So thank you very much Four, for bringing that to nine, us. Join eight, us on Think seven, Tech. One, <laughs> think Tech. Three, Hawaii, 27. anytime. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> that's Jesse Broda Van Dyke. He is the communications director of the city and county of Honolulu, telling us about what's on his plate these days now that the election is over. So uh, let's talk about rail. You raised it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> What's going on with rail? Absolutely. Well, I, I can tell you personally, I've been involved in this project for a long time. I had the honor and privilege to be in Senator Illinois' Appropriations Committee room when the Department of Transportation signed the full funding grant agreement. That is a contract that is in law, so regardless of the change of administration, uh, the federal government is committed to paying that money to the city for the project. Um, obviously, having a new administration, um, is concerning. Um, uh, the president-elect did say that he supports infrastructure and wants to fix our roads and bridges, so we'll see, but we're optimistic. Um, you know, Honolulu has the second worst traffic in the nation. It's unbelievable it's gotten to this point where only Los Angeles has worse traffic than we experience every single day. Everyone knows families spend two hours commuting in from Eva Beach. It's a major impact on quality of life. It also costs money, it costs gas. It's, you have to sit there in your car being all irritated when you could be reading the newspaper on the train. Um, I've lived in two cities that have great public transportation, Boston and Washington, D.C., and it's so convenient and easy that people of all income levels take it. People commute to Congress on the um, D.C. Metro from all over Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. Um, Obviously, uh, it's inconvenient now to build the rail project. It's going to be inconvenient when it comes down Dillingham Boulevard and comes into town. Um, it should have happened a long time ago, but all we can do is do it now. Once it opens, I really believe it'll revolutionize people's lives, especially out on the west side. It's transportation equity. We have you know, people who come over the Pali or on Kalaniano Ole Highway have much easier commutes than people who come from the west side. Mm -hmm. So this, um, this will be an opportunity for them. Obviously, it's costing money. And um, we already know that the project needs more money, um, so we'll need more help from the federal government or the state legislature to make that happen. Mm. So, um, what we have here is um, uh, is, a, is a you know a linear line, which doesn't go up the hills, as you mentioned, doesn't go up over mm -hmm. the poly, doesn't go to East Oahu, doesn't go to the university for that matter, mm -hmm. not in this iteration. Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to help people who? you know, need to do transportation, public transportation, from those areas. You know, I mean, there are some who feel that money's been drained off the bus system to put in the rail, and so the bus system isn't as good as it might have been. Um, how are we going to serve the people who are not on that line? Well, first of all, the rail project does not affect bus funding because it has a dedicated funding. 
uh, only federal funds and the GET surcharge are being spent on the rail project. Okay. The bus funds are separate. Uh, the full funding grant agreement did call for bus funds to be used if there was a shortfall, but Mayor Caldwell has already said he's absolutely not going to do that. So um, we're going to the legislature um, to ask for their help. Uh, when Mayor Caldwell went down two years ago to ask for the GET extension, he originally asked for it to be extended in perpetuity, which would allow Hart to start planning now for extensions. I think everybody agrees it should go to UH and it should go further uh, into Koppel A, and the line that was selected was selected because that was the most they could build with the funding that they had available at the time um, several years ago. Um, if we can get the funding, I, they can start planning to go to UH now. It would be great to do that before they stop building the project because we, they would still have all the equipment and contractors yeah, and here. momentum, yeah. Plus, it, once you stop, it'll probably be years and years before it goes start it again. up again, yeah. Um, so I think I would love to see it go to UH. I, we'd love to see a uh, spur go out to Mililani someday. We'd love to see it go further down to the west side. But this is just step one. You've got to start somewhere. Yes, but um, it's going to cost plenty, probably more than we ever expected. It started at, I want to say, less than $5 billion. Now it's way more than that. And, mm -hmm. you know, Parsons Brinkerhoff uh, made the big dig in Boston. It cost them three times more than what they thought. So, you know, it's a benchmark yeah. for me. Thankfully, they're doing way better than the big dig. Okay, good, good. <laughs> Happy to hear you. know that you were there, yes, right? Yes, I was there the whole time they were building that thing. And they didn't finish it when I went to college. And I have friends who live in Boston now. And they're like, this area is really nice with this great park and everything. And I'm like, you know what we went through to, for you to enjoy that park. It's great now that it's finished. So I guess, uh, you know, the question is, um, are we going to have enough money? You know, there are people who say that it's a great project, but can the city and county actually support it with or without federal funds? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and the issue is, I, ultimately, the one thing you have control over, the city has control over, is real property taxes. And there are people out there who say, well, we, we must have an increase in real property taxes to pay for this extraordinary multi-billion dollar project. Are they coming, increases in property tax? Well, the city cannot use property taxes to fund the project. The charter amendment that created HART specifies that they can only use the GET surcharge and federal funds. So that won't happen. The city will need to pay to run the system. Currently, the city subsidizes the bus system something like $100 million a year. It's one of the biggest expenses in the city budget. But obviously, it's a huge uh, service for lots of people who wouldn't be able to get to their jobs or live the lives that they do without that. Um, so the rail will be subsidized just like the buses, but the rail will be driverless. So you, you got to pay a, you know, a salaried bus driver for every single bus on the road. With the rail, you've got the equivalent of 20 buses worth of passengers in an automated train that no one's driving, and it's just being monitored from the system. Yeah. So um, it has the potential to be cheaper in the long run than just paying to run buses and uh, import petroleum, etc. I hope you'll invite us to the opening. We want to be there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the automated train. Yes, <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, it'll be after Mayor Caldwell's term okay, is over, well, so I might not be the one to be able to invite we'll you. We'll still know you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I hope whoever's the mayor in four years will invite <laughs> me to. <laughs> so talk about multimodal transportation. You know, one of the great frustrations is that the city does not have jurisdiction in Kaka'ako mm -hmm. where it really counts. Mm -hmm. And for my money, uh, you know, that should be changed. The city should have jurisdiction and the state HCDA should, you know, leave it <coughs> and let you do it the way you do the rest of the uh -huh. city. Um, but the other thing is, uh, uh, you know, we, we have the King Street, uh, King Street bike lane, uh -huh. uh, but we don't have anything in Kaimu Key just yet. Um, we have plans and we have talked about it forever, but nothing. Uh, we had Frank Fossey build a lot of bike lanes, uh -huh. but they seem to be either gone or misused or unused. and. I mean, what's the plan there? If we care about multimodal transportation, if we really care about bike lanes, we'd build them everywhere, wouldn't we? Yeah, and that's what Mayor Caldwell wants to do. Um, Honolulu is behind in terms of bike lanes compared to cities on the mainland. We have the best climate in the world for it. People bike through snow to get to work on the mainland. Here, you know, you can plan on it every day. You might get rained on, but that's the worst thing that'll happen. Um, the King Street protected bike lane has been a success. Um, I know there's a lot of drivers who find it inconvenient, but the good thing about it is that the bikes are no longer riding on the sidewalk, which is dangerous for pedestrians, mm -hmm. and they're not riding all over the street. It used to be like some pedestrians' uh, bikes would be on the left side of King Street, on the right side, weaving in with bikes. Now they have a protected lane. It's definitely safer for them. I, we also think it's safer for everyone else. We also um, think that King Street um, is, shouldn't be a super highway in the middle of the city. It's, it was six lanes wide before it had the most rate of pedestrian accidents. Um, so we do think we're making it safer by 
um, narrowing it so that you know when it's not rush hour, you can't just zoom down it at 50 miles an hour. Sure. Um, we and we are planning to build a grid of bike lanes. So um, we announced you mean Malcolm yes. As well. So South Street will be one of them. Um, you know, every one of them involves working with the, the neighbors. Um, the Waterfront Plaza Restaurant Row had some concerns about their loading docks, so we've been working to accommodate them. What's the holdup? Um, well, the King Street Lane was a pilot project, um, but we are, we're definitely going to move forward on it next year. So in 2017, you'll see that happen. Um, we, in Kaimuki, you mentioned, we did paint a bike lane on Wailai Avenue. They did look at putting a protected lane there, but there's not enough room, and there's a freeway on ramps and McDonald's that a lot of people turn into, so it just wasn't feasible at Turned that location. Right across the path of the bike right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, We're also looking at uh, adding painted bike lanes on Macaulay and protected bike, bike lanes on P.E. Koi and Pensacola. Um, I live in Makiki, um, and I ride my bike to work sometimes, and I have to go down um, Pen Pensacola Street, and it's like, death-defying, yeah. and everybody's trying to get to work, really hates seeing me there, but there's no other way for me to go. But do you agree with me, there's a tipping point. If you have uh, enough people, right now, if you look at uh, King Street, there's only a hand people right. using it, um, but if you had a lot more bike lanes, you'd have a lot more people out there because there'd be, you know, more opportunities to ride. And if you had a lot more people out there, then, oh, gee whiz, then the cars, I think, the drivers would be more sympathetic, and it's a, it's a spiral up, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely. Um, so, when can we expect to see that spiral materialize? And I think a lot of people don't want to bike because they feel unsafe, yes. right? And they would love to if they felt safe. Yes. Um, so, I, I think 2017 is going to be the year. We're going to go forward on a number of these protected bike lanes. Uh, bike Share Hawaii is getting ready to launch, so they're going to uh, put hundreds of bike share docking stations all over town. You'll be able to ride, you know, say you had a meeting in Waikiki, you could ride from town to Waikiki, dock the bike there, and check out another bike when you're ready to go back. Or if take the bus back, or if it starts raining, it, it gives you a lot more options, and you don't have to fold up your bike and put it in your car. Now, speaking for the million people who live in the city and county, I'm with you on that. All right. I want to see that. Make yeah. that happen. Will okay. you, Jesse? We will. We Tell will. the mayor. Yeah. We will. The other thing is, last thing, last thing we can discuss today with the amount of time we have is, uh, what about Mr. Trump? Uh, what about, you know, some of the promises or non-promises that he's made? How is that going to affect the city? Because cities all around the country have become dependent on federal assistance in various forms. And um, maybe, maybe there'll be more assistance in some areas or less than others. Uh, what do you expect? What's the plan to deal with it? I think, you know, nobody really knows what to expect. Um, the election results were shocking to a lot of us. Um, and we really don't know if the campaign rhetoric is going to be what happens or not. Um, it's definitely concerning. Um, our whole delegation are uh, Democrats, so it's not uh, in our best interest to have a Republican as president. Um, but all, all we can do is be hopeful and try to work with them. The good thing is we have the full funding grant agreement in place, um, but we really don't know if they're going to start cutting funds or what it would be for. Uh, mayor Caldwell is going up to the West Coast next month to meet with the West Coast Mayor's Conference. Mm. They have the Secretary of HUD, Julian Castro, coming out to meet with us. But, you know, it's be pretty for possible now. to plan, <laughs> plan forward. Yeah, so I wonder, you know, you've had a lot of press on a lot of these issues. Um, and I wonder if you, how you feel about the press in Hawaii dealing with the issues, not only the campaign, although that's part of it, but dealing with what the city does or doesn't do, um, you think the city is getting a fair shake? This is really going right to your job, isn't yeah. it? A fair shake from the press. And uh, if you were going to talk to the press now and sort of advise them about what they should focus on, what they should be looking at, you know, what, what would you say to them as a communications director? Well, I think we benefit a lot from journalism, and it's w how the public knows what we're doing for the most part. We do do social media and direct emails and things like that, but for the most part, the press is what, uh, what gets the word out and enables people to participate and, and give their thoughts. Um, you know, I'll say that uh, people who go into the journalism profession are honorable people. It's not something people do to get rich. They do it because they care about their community. I started my career in journalism and ended up leaving because I found it so hard to make ends meet. So I, I definitely respect them. Um, and I'll say in the 10 years I've been doing this, I've seen local media downsize significantly. Yeah. We had two newspapers who would fiercely compete with one another. Now yeah. we have one that just announced more layoffs. Um, we had four TV stations, now we have three. Two of the stations have been bought and sold by mainland companies that cut their staff. 
The AP Bureau only has a few reporters who for the most part can't leave the office because they need to be in the newsroom. Um, so it does worry me. I don't know what direction this is going in. It, you know, it keeps getting smaller and smaller and harder and harder for people to stay in business as journalists. Uh, how does it change your job as communications director, communicating with the press? Um, it makes it harder. Um, they have less reporters available, and when the reporters are doing stories, they usually need to turn them around very quickly and move on to the next thing. So a lot of times we have to rush to try to get them the information that they need within their deadline. I think most of them uh, try to give the city a fair shake um, when they come to us. Um, you know, a lot of what we do is responding to questions. Um, there was a story uh, that we're working on today about uh, a contractor, a tow company contractor with the city illegally storing cars on the street. Um, it was brought to our attention by KHON, and now um, the customer services department is going to make them cut that out because it's in violation of their contract. Um, so, I mean, that's a, just a small example of a positive impact that can come out of working with the media. You know, as communications director, you do deal more than just with the press mm -hmm. uh, and various media. Uh, and I wonder, uh, you know, what, what you would say to the public about dealing with the city, about getting information from the city, city's policies and proclivities about that, your office and other offices that are responsible to respond to, you know, public uh, requests for information. What's the policy? What, what do you see that evolving as? Um, we, re we try to respond to every letter and email that the mayor gets. Um, we have a whole staff uh, at the information branch that handles phone calls and, and questions and complaints. I, I think it is frustrating for people sometimes because they don't know where to call. Um, for example, you know, if you need to have a question about the DMV, which DMV do you call? Um, we, so we, we tried to build a website and put all that information on there, um, especially what kind of documents people need. Um, but, you know, I just encourage everyone to do please contact us. Um, we, we, you heard him say it. Yeah, he said it right you, here. You can call the mayor's office, 768-4141, <laughs> or you can email us at mayor at honolulu.gov or use the web form on honolulu.gov. So how do you think the city is doing? I mean, uh, you know, in many ways we're clearly, you know, a great place to live. In other ways, so we have issues. Uh, where are we on the continuum? How would you, you know, you've been around, you've seen yeah. the East Coast at least, and um, how do you feel how Hawaii, Honolulu rather, is doing these days vis-a-vis -vis other places, including the neighbor islands? Are we healthy, hearty? Do we have a good quality of life? Do we have good public spaces? Do we have uh, a kind of mm, a, a social experience that draws people? Um, I think there's always room for improvement. I really am enjoying this job because it's a great opportunity to give back to my hometown. I don't think I would like working for the mayor of Akron, Ohio or something like that, but I grew up here. I, I always wanted to see more bike lanes. I always wanted to see public transportation, and we're doing those two things. Um, you know, our, our parks could always be nicer, uh, but we've launched a program of bathroom and playground improvements, and we've done three dozen already. Um, so we're making, I, I feel very good that we're making progress. I think, like you mentioned, uh, cost of living is always going to make it harder to live here. Yeah. Um, that's not something we can wave a wand and fix, but we can try to build more housing and create affordable housing so families can stay here. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to make groceries cheaper, but we could ma make uh, more electricity cheaper by building so more solar power. power and. Uh, we expanded H Power. We now have three boilers at H Power, and we lead the nation in waste to energy conversion and divert more than 90% of our trash out of the landfill. Uh, we want to get to 100%, but we need some more technology to deal with the ash and things like that. Um, we built a sludge intake machine, so now all the product from the wastewater treatment plant gets burned and turned into power. So every time you use the bathroom, you're helping to power our city. Um, so we're making progress. <laughs> Feels about that. So nice that you're there, Jesse, as the city as communications director, and Thank so you. nice that you're here at Think Tech. We, it's been great to talk yeah, to you, it was a lot of fun. and I hope we can talk to you again Definitely. and again and right. get and get updated on all these things going forward. Thank Very you so good. much. Okay, thanks a lot, Jay. Aloha. It was great. Appreciate it. <laughs> Here.